This is my talk about earning money with open source. I gave it at the web engineering meetup Aachen at the end of 2020. The organizers gladly allowed me to share it on my YouTube channel. I'm basically trying to answer the question, why am I not making 100K on GitHub? Um, and then you might not even want to start. And really, this is a talk about those people, those people that are in that position right now. They have the mindset that it's probably not worth it uh, to spend that much effort into open source if it takes so long uh, until you find success. Now, this talk turned out to be a little grim, surprisingly. Um, I had this very motivational talk in mind, but in reality, it's hard. And by hard, I mean it's really hard. And I just want to get this point across and maybe still motivate you to do it. But first, why am I entitled to talk about this? Well, because everyone is, and I'm just a normal human being, so why not? Uh, but as a side note, I've been doing open source since 10 years, over 10 years now. And yeah, this is a talk dedicated to my former self, maybe 15 years ago. Um, I work at Trivago, which is a hotel search company based in Düsseldorf. I have a blog at endler.dev and like everyone and their mom, I also have a YouTube channel. Uh, it's called Hello Rust. I'm extremely active, uh, one video every two years. So you definitely want to subscribe to not miss any updates. But today I want to talk about open source. And I have a very sophisticated outline with two points, my journey and revenue models. Let's go back all the way to 2010. The word definitely looked a bit different by then. This was GitHub. And I was a bit late to the game. I joined in January 2010. And by then, GitHub already was two years old. So my username was taken. And I usually go by the handle MRE on platforms. And I noticed that this handle was not used by anyone. So I just sent a mail to support and asked if I could have it. And then I got an answer from this guy saying, go for it. That's uh, Chris Wanstreff, who goes by the handle defunct, and he's the former CEO of GitHub. And at this point in time, I was hooked. Um, I really liked the platform. I really liked how they worked very hands-on with open source. And I used it for some projects of mine. You can see in the screenshot, I, for example, uploaded my blog to GitHub because they host it for free. Um, and this is built with Jekyll. You just push it to their site and then they statically generate it and it's done. And it goes without saying that nothing has changed in the last 10 years because my blog more or less still looks like that. It's not built with jQuery and Jekyll anymore, but with Solar and Cloudflare worker sites, but it's more or less the same thing. For preparing for this talk, I wanted to take a step back and see where I was coming from and where I am right now. And probably the best way to do it is to look up some statistics and see, yeah, maybe the number of repositories over time would give me some insight. And so I queried uh, the GitHub API for my number of repositories that I had. And you can see it's pretty much a linear graph from 2010 all the way to 2020 except for maybe 2018, where I reached peak productivity, it seems, but oh well. In the end, it's more or less a linear thing. And you might say, uh, you put some work in, you get some feedback out or some productivity. But in reality, it's different. There's a compound effect. If we look at my number of stars over time, you can see that, yeah, more or less, it started very slowly and now, I guess it's sort of an expansion grow, exponential growth. So right now we are at 25,000 stars across all projects. And this is really a compound effect over time. And another way to look at it would be the number of followers. That's kind of a new concept to me. But I did look up some statistics from the archive, archive.org, because GitHub doesn't have that information through their API. And again, it's more or less an exponential growth. More or less, what you can say is 
you put some work in, but you get a compound effect of your work plus some interest out. And this is not luck, it's work. And that means you know what you're doing and it's success over time. And that is great. But at the same time, there's an elephant in the room. And that is, it's just a pat on the back. We have earned zero dollars until now. And one question you might have is, where's the money? Like, how do you monetize this effort? First off, is it an effort? Well, um, I don't know about you, but I probably spend two or three hours on average per day on open source and across projects, thinking about open source and creating new projects, but also maintaining and code review. So it is really work and it's a lot of work. And you more or less do that for free. There's nothing wrong with doing things for free and doing it as a hobby, but then you are supposed to be working on whatever you like. Open source is sometimes not like that. Sometimes you have obligations and you feel responsible for maybe helping people out. And this is a big part of it. And you do that next to your normal work. So it can really be a burden. And if you don't know by now, making this somehow valuable is hard. It's, it's, it's really hard. And I want to talk about some ways to build a proper revenue model from open source. It goes without saying that probably this should not be your first focus if you saw the graphs before. But once you reach a point where you want to get some revenue, you have a couple of options. First off, I don't want to talk about make, doing open source as part of your business, like as being an employer. Uh, and also, I don't want to talk about um, bigger companies and, and bigger support here. I want to focus on a couple of things that everyone can do. Um, sponsoring is one. Paid learning materials. That means on top of your normal documentation, you might have a video series uh, that you ask for money for. Um, merchandising, like Mozilla does. Consulting next to your open source business for some companies and enterprise services and plugins. Like for example, writing ADFS plugins or um, high availability functionality. That's a very common thing that you can build next to open source that is maybe a paid feature for enterprises. But let's start with the basics. And let's start with point number one, sponsoring. There are two kinds of sponsoring. The first one is individual donations, individual sponsoring. This is probably what GitHub Sponsors is all about. And it starts a bit like that. In any way you want to earn money, you have to think about the funnel. And you have to think about how you capture people's attention and how you monetize that. It starts with a product, can be anything. From there, you generate interest. And this interest more or less creates an audience and that audience eventually might pay for your service. And this is actually the entire secret. It's how you earn money with any product and with open source if you want to attract sponsors. And that is you build a product people want. If you transfer that to open source, then it looks a bit like that. Building a project is maybe a repository. And the stars indicate the interest of an audience. The audience itself gets generated by followers, like it's made out of followers. Personal followers or followers of a company can be anything on also different platforms. And those followers might or might not become sponsors in the end. Now, I know stars are a really bad metric for popularity um, because some people use stars differently than others. For example, some use it as bookmarks to check out projects later. Others want to um, thank the developers for maybe putting in a lot of effort and so on. But it's a good first estimation. Now, um, think about the following. Think about the amount of stars I have and the followers and the number of sponsors. And think about those numbers 
and think about my funnel right now. So I told you that I have 25,000 stars and roughly 1,000 followers. And out of those, I have three sponsors. So the ratio between the stars and the sponsors is 0.01%. That looks pretty grim. That means you need around 8,000 stars to attract a single supporter. And I was wondering, like, maybe it's just me. Maybe, like, the top 1,000 GitHub uh, owners or maintainers, they might not have that problem, right? Well, it turns out it's exactly the same schema. So if you take the top 1,000 GitHub um, maintainers, and you look at their sponsors, then it's, again, a pretty grim picture. Um, looking at the median, for example, you look at 3,421 followers per person and a median of zero sponsors. That's 0% if my math is correct. And if you look at the average, then you even have 5,430 followers because Linus Torvalds pushes up that number. Um, then you have 2.8 sponsors out of that on average, and that is 0.5%, which is a bit more than me, but it's roughly in the same ballpark. Now, think about this. GitHub has 40 million users. So that means the top 1,000 maintainers make up 0.0025% of the entire community. And the median income of those maintainers is basically zero from GitHub, obviously. That in and on itself is maybe not the biggest problem, but keep in mind that the GitHub revenue of 2019 was $300 million. And people even joke about that now. So I read that comment on Hacker News yesterday. I have sponsors on GitHub and rake in a cool $2 per month. It's obviously less of the taxes, so I have to have a day job. Um, so this is clearly not working. Um, you have to think of different ways to monetize open source if you want to do that uh, right now. Or you just wait until GitHub sponsors becomes more popular, whatever happens first. And one way... I just want to quickly touch on is the notion of sponsorware. It's kind of a new concept and some people haven't heard of it before, but I honestly really like it. It has its disadvantages, but generally speaking, what you do is you create a project and you keep it secret uh, or you keep it private. You talk about it on Twitter though, or any other platform and you say, Hey, I'm building this, but if you want early access, you have to become a sponsor. And then once you reach a certain threshold of sponsored sponsors or income or whatever, then you make a project public. And this initial example that I showed you where someone was earning 100K on open source, this is from someone that is doing something like that and building literally products and services, but talking about it and then making it open for everyone in the end. So this is some advantages. First off, you get early feedback from people that really believe in your mission. And that's great. Um, and second, you don't have to work for free all the time. And third, you might also create an audience and a hype from your projects. So there's nothing wrong with that. The disadvantage really is that if you are a hardcore open source or even free software um, believer, then this goes kind of against your ethic because you want software to be open to begin with, without any additional um, yeah, requirements. So you really have to make up your own mind about that. I tried. Um, I have uh, an early access program, which I only share with sponsors. Um, right now, a single sponsor, because that's the lowest level you need to have. Um, and yeah, basically it's a tool for getting statistics on GitHub. The statistics I initially created were created with that tool. And yeah, it kind of is interesting. I think you need a big audience to pull that off. And the question is, 
if you want to put in this effort uh, or you just want to make it open in the first place and think about other revenue models. But I think still it's a very interesting concept and we might see that in the future. So you know now how it looks like and you have a name for it. Another one is corporate sponsoring. Now, this is a double-edged sword because corporate sponsoring means that a company is giving you money and sometimes they want something from it. They might want additional support or they want a bug to be fixed. And more or less, it feels like you are somehow beginning to work for them. Um, but nevertheless, those companies, they put in quite a big uh, amount of money into open source these days. Looking at two big companies, Facebook and Google, they put in 177K and 845K respectively into open source over their lifetime on Open Collective, which is a platform for collecting those um, donations. And that's really great. We need more companies doing that. But also as a little side note and maybe as a little rant, I believe that those companies are doing way too little. Um, Facebook's revenue last year was 70 billion and Google had 160 billion, which is nothing to be ashamed of. So I wonder really if this is the most they can do. Of course, Google, for example, also donated to other projects like Mozilla. And yeah, they also organize meetups and so on. I can see all that. But really, do you think that Facebook and Google would exist today if there was no Python or web server or Linux back in the day when two Stanford students tried to build a search engine? And yeah, it's kind of... Sometimes I feel that Fortune 500 companies really don't understand how much they depend on open source and how many um, people really depend on a few people that maintain critical parts of our infrastructure. I don't think that they nearly invest enough into open source. What a lot of people think is that open source works like uh, the panel on the left, where you have a full room of engineers trying to figure out the best way to build a project. And in reality, it's more or less someone working late at night to fix bugs and doing it because they believe in it. And the pu public perception is probably um, wrong. And there's a really small group of people maintaining critical infrastructure. And sometimes that can lead to very tricky situations. Um, two of my heroes from my childhood, they talked about it openly. Kenneth Wrights is the core maintainer of requests for Python and Antares is the creator of Redis, which is a key value store. So one is from more or less front-end development, the other one from back-end, if you would like to think like that. And they both talk about burnout here because the burden of becoming an open source maintainer on a big scale can very much and very quickly lead to burnout. The internet never sleeps. You never go to sleep. You always get a ticket, a feature request, a pull request, an issue. You always have something to work on. And on top of that, you have to do all your other responsibilities. So that can lead to burnout really quickly. There was one guy, which I also respect deeply. His, his name is Mark Pilgrim. He is the author of Dive Into Python. And he once pulled a 410... I guess it's, that's how it's called, for deleting everything on his internet. Um, there's actually a term for it, infocide or something like that, for information suicide or something like that. Anyway, he got fed off, up with the ecosystem. And if you think about the Ruby community, you might know why the author of uh, the Pwana Guide to Ruby, he did kind of the same thing. Like focusing on what Antar has said, he said, once I started to receive money to work at Redis, it was no longer possible for my ethics to have my past pattern. So I started to force myself to work under normal schedules. This for me is a huge struggle for many years at this point. Moreover, I'm sure I'm doing less than I could because of that, but this is how things work. So it fe feels like he feels guilty um, for maybe being forced into that work uh, schedule 
and maybe not performing enough. There's some signs of burnout for me somehow. And it's that love-hate relationship of open source and money. If you accept money, it becomes a job. Uh, but most of the time, you're not writing code. You're writing the docs, you're reviewing pull requests, you're looking at issues, you're answering questions on Stack Overflow, you're discussing on Discord, you're marketing on YouTube or conferences. And really, when you become popular in open source, then it feels like you have a choice between two options. One is depression and the other one is burnout. If your project does not become successful, then suddenly you think you're the failure, you're the mistake, it has zero stars, nobody likes it. But if it becomes a success, then everyone likes it and you get hugged to death. So that's really an unfortunate situation to be in. And really, you want to stop being overwhelmed with those responsibilities. You have to set clear boundaries and, yeah, really pick your poison. You, you have to be careful if you accept companies as sponsors. And I want to show you maybe one example how it can work, but also some risks. So early this year, I started working on a project for real that I had been putting off for, for many years before. You see, in December 2015, I started a list of static analysis tools on GitHub. Static analysis tools are just tools that help you improve your code. And it turns out that there's a lot of those tools. And just starting to collect them was the first step. I didn't think much about it. But over time, that was my microphone. Everyone's awake now. Um, <laughs> that became really popular. And you can see that this graph is more or less a linear in, increase in stars over time. And I guess back in 2018 or so, I started really thinking hard about um, whether there was more than just a GitHub project here. And I talked to many people. Many people are also in this room now. Um, Andy knows for, for sure. Uh, Simon knows that I had this idea of maybe building something more from that. And it really took someone else to maybe push me over the finishing line and convince me that this was worth it. And that is Jakub. Um, I even put an arrow here on the right side so that you don't mix us up. I'm not that small, really. Uh, so he, he's kind of large. Um, and he said, like, why not build a website from it? Um, why, why not try? And so over the course of maybe two weekends or so, we built a website. And yeah, it's built with Gatsby, but it really doesn't matter. Um, we just did it, and then we saw what happened with it. And we render four, 500 tools right now, and the initial feedback was really great. Um, people really seemed to like that, and we got a cool 720,000 requests on the first day, and over the course of the next week or so, it more or less hit 1.5 million. And it was great because suddenly people started get interest, getting interested in that project and we started finding some sponsors. Those companies, they are special because they believe in your mission, but also they know how open source works. They don't really expect you to advertise their tool. They want to sell to developers. So they want to be in the public mind of the developers and saying, hey, you are a developer, we built this amazing tool, you might want to check it out. But also they get seen as an open source company. And I think it's a win-win. I have to say, it doesn't always go as easily. Sometimes companies expect you to just have a cheap advertising space for them and then they jump off the moment they see you don't get that many clicks. But some others, they understand that you invest into something that maybe pays off in a year or two from now. So I'm really thankful that some companies understand that mission. But what companies want is different than what individuals want. Companies want an invoice. Companies want something tax deductible. Companies want someone that is um, keeping the lights on and that is responsive per, via email. So you really have those obligations. And one platform that helps with that is Open Collective. On Open Collective, you can maybe put that burden of being a fiscal host to the maintainers of Open Collective. 
they have a 501c6 program for open source projects that acts as a fiscal host, um, which means they will hand do all the invoicing and they will officially be the maintainers. And if you as just an open source maintainer of that or a contributor of that project, you want to get money from your project, you have to send an invoice to Open Collective. And I think that's the best of both worlds again, because it's a very transparent progress uh, process. Companies are in the loop and you don't have to deal with all the financial stuff. At least not, yeah, with, with companies. But it also means that you have to really polish your public perception. Companies really want to know what they can get out of sponsoring you. And you have to make that very clear. That's probably the most important site that you have is not your website, but it's your sponsor's page on GitHub where you describe the different tiers and what those tiers mean. So we have three tiers for companies. One is targeted at smaller companies and freelancers, and they just get exposure and they get seen as an open source friendly tech company. That is at $100 a month. Then we have a middle tier, a company sponsor that maybe is a bigger company. They get the batch too, but they also get a blog post about a static analysis tool that they want to promote. But we make it transparent that this is really a sponsored content. And then if you want to go all the way, then you go to full content creation, which might be a video workshop. But we don't really have video workshop sponsors yet. So I cannot talk about that yet. Um, I have to say, I really would like to try though. And it's cheap really for what you get. Um, anyway, those are things that you can do today without really changing how you work on open source. You can, you can set it up today and you just see how it goes. Maybe no one reacts and that's also fine. Everything else on that list is kind of advanced. You already need an audience, and so you should start with that. If you look at number two up to five, then that is something that you have to get really involved in. Um, paid learning materials, yeah, maybe this is something that we are more or less doing with analysis tools in the future, with a video course. Um, there are companies like Tailwind that do that impressively well, um, so you can learn from them merchandising, um, you kind of have to have a brand. So it's not something that I could do, but some someone like Mozilla or like the coding train on, on YouTube, they could definitely do something like that. Consulting, that's always an option, but it's also a lot more work and probably it takes you away from what you really love. So it really becomes a job. You have to think about whether you want to do that or not. And enterprise services, this is something very advanced for maybe the 1% of projects that can be run in a business and where you have special requirements. So this is really hard. I have to say, start from the top and work your way down. Start to create an audience. And it's probably easier to create an audience on Twitter and then funnel it back to GitHub than the other way around. Oh, by the way, did I tell you it's hard? Like, probably it's, it's also really hard. But I really don't want to stop here on a on a low note um, i really want to emphasize that i would do it again all of that if i started today i think there's no better time to contribute to open source than today and probably tomorrow will even be a better time because suddenly a way more people are interested it's way easier to set up projects you have all those free tools like vs code like um what github is doing with github actions um, free hosting and it's just amazing how much you can pull off with very little money involved so you can you can try you can experiment what like what's the worst thing that can happen no no one cares well okay um then you're as good as me um but i have some tips for for you if you want to start today my first tip do your homework a lot of people start with learning and then they build things and then they close the circle. But there's one key piece missing here. And some people hate the word, but you learn to love it eventually. It's called marketing. 
And marketing means a lot of things to a lot of people. But what it means to me is getting the word out because someone else will if you don't. And you are awesome. You just have to realize that maybe not everyone knows right away. So you should really talk about it more. Maybe at conferences. See what I did there? Um, maybe on Twitter. Maybe you can just tell your friends. And maybe you can ask people to contribute and to support you. Like, what's wrong with that? Somehow it's frowned upon in the community that if you do marketing, you're not doing it for real. But I think that's not true. Um, I think that if smart people and patient and um, passionate people as well, if they did marketing, then the world would be a better place. Um, because I'm pretty sure the evil guys do marketing. <laughs> so do your homework. Um, but rest assured that being an open source maintainer means running a business and you are the product. So have think about why someone would want to sponsor you. And you really have to come up with an answer for that because if you don't come up with, with an answer, how should they know? And also think about the funnel. How will people find you? For example, the best way for people to find you is probably starting a YouTube channel. It's the easiest but it's, uh, there are easier ways. Um, you can always help out in a different project. Um, and you don't even have to be a coder. Um, if you are good with design, then I can tell you there's so many open source projects that need designers. It's crazy. Maybe start creating a logo for a small project and start getting some visibility. Another one is have fun. Like if you know that earning money is hard in open source, then that can also be liberating because it means that you can experiment and you can be creative. And yeah, having fun is the most important thing, I guess. But number two is build things you love because it's in the end your free time. The chances that someone will find the project is pretty low. And so it better be something that you're really interested in. So if you don't believe in that, just move on to the next thing. It's, it's fine if you drop a project that you don't believe in anymore. No one will hold you accountable for, for that unless they are jerks and yeah, you don't want to be surrounded by jerks, I hope. Um, number three is find friendly people because you really grow with your community. You want people that support your project and maybe eventually become maintainers to ease the burden. And that takes a lot of time, sometimes years until you find one maintainer. And so always be friendly, try to put yourself in their perspective, like go the extra mile. If you can, for example, reintegrate the master branch into their pull request and just do it for them. Uh, say thanks twice um, if, if you're unsure. Fourth is grow an audience. Um, and radical marketing is one way, but being approachable and being inclusive is another way. You want to be the guy that or the girl that people go to when they have a tough question or they want to know how to get into open source. You want to be the person that helps them out on their first pull request. They will pay, that will pay off a thousand times. I can guarantee you. The most exciting people I met so far, they are available for questions and they don't really ask for anything in return. And then you hold them very close and dear to your heart. And when the time comes, you will remember those people. And we will say like, oh, this is an amazing person to work with. I can highly recommend them. And yeah, that's called a lead. And finally, be in it, be in it for the long run. That means good things take time. You can see it took 10 years for me. Maybe it takes five years for you or maybe even less, but probably not an overnight success. So it's really a long-term investment. But I think um, initially in the introduction round, I said that I picked up running. I think that's another thing. It's a long-term process. You have to like every step somehow. And if you don't, then, well, that's also fine, but at least know that maybe there's a reward down the line, like a compound effect. Think about work instead of luck. That's all I got. I'm 35 minutes on the time. Perfect. Uh, if you want to yeah, chat, reach out to me. On my GitHub, you find a link where you can even set up a calendar appointment right away. 
and we can talk about anything you want, any project, anything you have in mind. If you want to start with a pull request today, uh, let me know. I, I can help you out. And I'm also on Twitter. Surprise. That's it. Thank you. If you like to support my open source work, please head over to my GitHub sponsors page.